please stand with me. Please be seated and thank you, family and friends who have gathered here for a See You at the Top celebration. And as usual, Zig is packing them in. You rarely see a memorial service of this size. And so many of us have come today because of our love and respect for Zig Ziglar, our love for Gene and this family, and our love for Christ who is the resurrection and the life. And so we've gathered not uh, only to mourn, though our tears are real, but we have gathered also to worship and to draw our hearts near to the Christ that Zig loved, to the Savior that he followed. And as you can imagine, Zig thought about this day, and on June 18, 2001, Zig made an appointment uh, with me, and he came by, 
and he had a letter, this letter in his hand. And he asked me to read it and then we discussed it. He said, as we discussed some time ago, I would like to make my arrangements for my funeral services. I have no hint or inner feeling that the day is going to come soon, but we both know that we never really know, only God does. I just believe it's prudent to prepare for the inevitable. And here's what he said. I believe the major objective of my funeral should be to serve as an evangelistic occasion for the lost and as an encouragement for other Christians. If based on your experience, my choices of songs and procedures are not the most conducive for persuading others to join me in eternity, please make whatever changes you deem advisable. (laughs) We didn't change a thing. He goes on to mention some favorite scriptures that we're going to be sharing, some wonderful songs that he asked to be sung uh, today, and the desire of his heart that you, each of you, all of us, would experience the love and the joy of knowing Jesus and serving him all the days of our life until it is time for us to go home. Uh, Zig wanted to take as many people to heaven with him as possible. He has done that, he is doing that, and he is doing that still. So as per Zig's request, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place among your people who call upon your name. We pray, O Lord, that you would be exalted and worshiped. We pray that Jesus would be glorified and magnified, that your Holy Spirit would move with freedom and liberty into every heart, bringing comfort and conviction and commitment. We thank you as we honor the life of Zig Ziglar that we honor you. And we pray, O God, with the confidence that Zig is with you and the certainty that our hope in you, the resurrection and the life, will comfort us and encourage us today. May every word spoken, every song sung, every thought that we think introduce us in a bigger way, a greater way to you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. And he came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know the future and life is worth a living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross the river and I'll fight Life's final war with pain And then as death 
it gives way to victory. I'll see the light of glory, and I'll know that He lives because He lives. Yes, I can face tomorrow. The fear is gone because I know, yes, I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. This life is worth a living just because he lives. My name is Iker Iker. I have a wonderful privilege today to be able to stand here and I thank Jack Graham and Prestonwood Church and the Ziegler family for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be able to talk about a man that helped to bring so much change into my life. I'm just kind of curious. I think I'm in good company. How many of you have had some way Zig Ziegler has helped to change your life? How about raised your hand? There you go. Uh, God has used him in a remarkable way. You know, a lot of times as a pastor, I have people come to me and they have one particular question and that particular question is, how do I really define in my life what my passions are and how do I find my purpose in life? And one of my very favorite ways to help people be able to navigate that question is I'll ask them, who are the three biggest heroes that you have in your life and why are they your heroes? Give me the reasons why. And what you often find out is that the people who are heroes in your life have called you to your highest and your best about the way that you're going to spend your life and what would really give you significance in your life. And Zig Ziglar was one of those people who did that for me at a degree that's just amazing. I don't mind telling you, and I've told his family over and over, Zig is my hero. He's one of those people that walked into my life in a, a usual way that heroes sometimes walk into your life. They're at a distance. And I'd read some of his books, and I'd listened to some of his tapes, but I'd never been able to see him in person. I would only listen to those tapes, and I would read those books. And I was a 23-year-old that had dropped out of college. Well, actually plucked out of college. They dropped me. And I read this book called See You at the Top. It actually had a different title back in those days. And when I read that book, my entire life changed. I had just become, Jack, a, a brand-new Christian. I just accepted Christ into my life and this person gave me this book and said you need some direction and I read see you at the top and I sat down and I wrote out a list of what I wanted to accomplish in my life and number one was to be able to go to college. My parents both had fifth grade educations. I grew up in inner city Atlanta. My dad worked in rock quarries all of his life. And I read that book and I really began to believe that I could be the first person in all of my family to be able to go to college. And because of Zig's book, I made that commitment. And I went to college and, and it was an amazing experience to be the first person in all of your family to be able to earn a college degree and then to go on and earn a master's and then to go on and to earn a doctorate. So I met him the usual way that a lot of people meet their heroes, they're at a distance. But then one day I got the opportunity to meet him up much closer in a very unusual way. I was preaching here in Dallas at the First Baptist Church of Dallas and I was so excited and thrilled to be there with W.A. Criswell and that great church and that morning I can still remember the message that I preached. It was on David and Goliath and the title of it was How to Survive Being Five Foot Nine in a Nine Foot World Full of Giants. 
And I preached that message, and in the middle of the message, I talked about how David had that uncanny ability to be able to see himself the way that God was seeing him. And not to focus on the giant, but you focus on God. And I quoted Zig Ziglar. And I said, you know, as Zig Ziglar is fond of saying, you can never consistently perform in a manner that's inconsistent with the way that you see yourself. And then I used his great illustration about he was such an optimist that he would go out, search down Moby Dick in a rowboat, and take the tartar sauce with him. And so, you know, I'm quoting Zig Zig. Man, I've got ziggerisms that are just flying that morning at First Baptist Dallas. And I finished my message, and when I finished my message, I went down, had the opportunity to meet people there at the church, and this well-dressed gentleman waited very patiently in the line of folks that were there to speak, and finally he stepped up, and when he did, he said, I like what you had to say about that Ziggler fella. And I said, are you a Zig fan? He said, well, I better be because I am Zig Ziglar. <laughs> I did not have a clue. And he realized I was not faking it, that I had no idea. I squeal like a 12-year-old girl at a Justin Bieber concert. I mean, I was just, I couldn't believe. I said, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I said, my wife's here. Please, will you just stand right here? Can I go get my wife? And I run over and I get Robin. I bring her over and I go, Robin, this is Zig Ziglar. And Robin looks at him and says, oh, my goodness the times that I hear him quote you over and over. And then my wife has a way of always saying a little more than she should. She said sometimes he quotes you more than the Bible. And, um, <laughs> and, and I probably had been, to be quite honest with you. And so she said, you know, you are Ike's hero. And she said, if I had a dollar for every time that I hear him quote you, not only in the pulpit, but in our home, I'd be a very rich person. And Zig was so gracious with what she had to say. And he said, Ike, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, number one, he said, do you mind if I get a cassette of this morning's message? We weren't having CDs in those days. And I want to send it to a friend of mine named Dexter Yeager. I didn't know who Dexter Yeager was. And Zig said, um, you know, I want to send it to him because I believe you could be a speaker for that organization. And so for the next 20 years of my life, I, I did that. Then the second question he had was this. He said, do you mind if I call you sometime? And I was like, oh, no, I would be thrilled if you called me. I, I mean, this is Zig Ziglar asking me this. And I said, oh, no, sir, I, I would be absolutely thrilled. And so one Saturday morning, I get a call from Zig Ziglar. I mean, I was absolutely stunned. I didn't have caller ID in that day. Now, Zig was one of the first people I knew that did have caller ID. And when I would call him, he'd say, well, it's my friend Ike Reichert. I couldn't figure that out for years. I mean, you know, I'm not that bright, okay? I want you to understand how much Zig changed my life because this is what he had to work with right here. And so he calls on a Saturday morning, and, and one of the things he did is he said, I'm going to have Laurie Major." I'm going to have her call your office, and I want to get some of the cassettes of some of the messages that you've preached. And so we started sending those on a regular basis. So that Saturday morning when he called, he, he, said, uh, he said, I, I've been listening to your messages. And he said, you, you really believe that the Bible is God's inerrant, infallible word, don't you? And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Ziegler, I, I, I do from top to bottom. I absolutely believe it. I wasn't sure what he was going to say from that point on. And so he said to me, he said, well, he said, I tell you what then. I want you to be my own call preacher. And I said, what does that mean? He said, that means you're my own call preacher. When I call, you answer. And I said, oh, okay, sir. I, th I think I can do that. And he said, so what I'm going to do is I want you to help answer some questions for me. He said, I have a Sunday school class and all of that. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I am so humble because I know his pastor, Jack, is W.A. Criswell. And yet he's asking me to be the on-call pastor. And I, and I said, well, Zick, you know, I would be thrilled to do that. And I'll be glad to help you with your Sunday school class and everything. And I'm just thrilled that you would choose me to do that instead of like a Dr. Criswell. And he said, well, I... I teach my Sunday school class at a fifth grade level. And he said, um, I think you've about got that level nailed down. And so that was, that began, that began my Saturdays with Zig. 
Every time he called, it would be the same opening. Ike, this is your old buddy, Zig. And then he would start asking questions. And he would say, now, you're, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I, Yes, sir, I am. And are you a theologian? And I go, well, it's written on the side of my ring, this ring right here. And I go, so, so yes, sir. And so we would begin to talk. And I'd be sitting there with all kinds of commentaries around me, you know, grabbing them as fast as I could to answer his questions. And it became a regular event for us at our house that it was Saturday mornings with Zig. My family would know, I'm going to get a call, I'm going to get to talk to him, and, and it was wonderful. And one Saturday, he had called back about a particular passage of Scripture, and I didn't get to call back till 10, 15 at night. And so when, when he was getting ready to hang up, he said, by the way, Ike, I thought you'd want to know, my mama said only trashy people call after 10. And so I... <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to call after 10 anymore. I was going to make sure that I had it right in the right zone. So I became his on-call pastor, and he, he was already my mentor. You, you know it. Zig was amazing. You know that. He had that uncanny ability to inspire better than anyone that I've ever known. I know we use the word motivator with him, but to me it's inspiration because to inspire means you breathe life into something. And how many people's dreams did he breathe life into? How many people's businesses did he breathe life into? How many people who were so down on life they were ready to give up? I can't tell you how many people have told me I was ready to end my life. And then I heard Zig Ziglar. It's amazing. I mean, he had a gift from God and he knew he had the gift from God. And Jack Graham and I were talking earlier in his study and I knew what Jack was going to talk about from the scripture when he talked about Zig, and there, there's only one person, and Jack's going to really unpack it for you, but it's Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. Zig Ziglar was the greatest encourager that I've ever met in my life. You know, you wanted him to be your dad. You wanted him to be your granddad. You at least wanted him to be your uncle, and, you know, you wanted him to be your friend, and he was a teacher, and he's a mentor, and he was all of those things, and all I can say to the Ziegler family is thank you for sharing him. Thank you for giving him up a lot of time so that the rest of us could be blessed and could be honored and be encouraged because that's what he was every time. Our role kind of changed when Suzanne got saved. And um, times were, were, were getting close on her going to be with the Lord. And um, he would call me late at night. See, I had lost a wife and child during childbirth. And I had walked a certain path that Zig hadn't walked in losing a child. And we would sit and we would talk. And of course, Zig being Zig, he turned around and wrote the book Confessions of a Grieving Christian. And how many people have had their life so encouraged during the darkest times because of that book. Then one day he called me. And uh, I'd been talking with my wife and my daughter, and uh, I was out of goals temporarily. My daughter said, well, you've always had a goal. And I said, well, right now I'm just, you know, I'm kind of at a place in my life. She said, if there's one thing in the world that you could do, what would you do? And I said, oh, I'd co-author a book with Zig Ziglar she said well you ought to call him your friends and I said no you don't do that you don't call Zig Ziglar and go hey I've got a great idea let us write a book you don't do that <laughs> about three weeks after she said that I get a call from Zig I it's your old buddy Zig I want to ask you to do me a favor and he said now I want you to feel free to say no a lot of times the lawyer would call me and he's coming to town I'd pick him up and escorting around we'd go to dinner and I mean, I was just so thrilled to do that. And I said, yes, sir. I was just sure he was going to come to Atlanta. He said, I want us to do a book together. My first thought was, if my daughter Abigail calls Zig Ziglar, I, I will disown her. I will not have anything to do with her the rest of my life. And he went through and he, and he said, here's what I want to do. He said, uh, I want it to be a book like the Saturday mornings we spent. I just want us to help explain some scripture to people. And I said, like a daily devotional? He said, like a daily devotional. And so we started putting that book together. And it was the greatest experience of my lifetime. You know, when 
You just know, as a son, you know where I'm coming from. In bed the other night, after Zig had passed, Robin and I were talking. And she said, you know, Ike, you think he's the greatest speaker you've ever heard, don't you? I said, yeah, for me, he's, he's the best. She said, you know what I think he was the greatest at? And I said, no. She said he was the best listener I've ever been around. She said, you know, you would see him more often than I would get to, but I might see him two years afterwards, and there would have been something that we talked about. And he'd say, by the way, Robin, how did that turn out? You know what? She's right. He was a great listener. He was a great friend. So in a lot of ways, this is my last Saturday morning with Zig. In a lot of ways. And um, all the scriptures that we studied, all the times after his daughter went to be with the Lord, y'all's daughter went to be with the Lord, we talked about heaven a lot. Talked about heaven a lot. And, and you know the thing is? All of those things that Zig Ziglar, he was a man of faith. All of the things that Zig Ziglar accepted by faith, he's now seeing with his sight. No longer does he walk by faith. Now he walks by sight. Because, as Zig would tell you, there was a lady who shared her faith, Sister Jessie. On the July the 4th weekend, 1972, she shared her faith and Zig embraced Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. And I tell you what, Zig did a lot of things with multi-marketing companies. If there is a downline for Sister Jessie, she has hit the mother load, y'all. <laughs> I'm just telling you, she has. All the thousands who have come to Christ because of the influence of Zig Ziglar. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even if he dies, meaning physically. And anyone who lives and believes in me, spiritually speaking, will never die. And he said, Martha, do you believe this? And Zig Ziglar on the 4th of July weekend, 1972, said what Martha said. Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who comes into this world. And I promise you this, he's waiting to see you. And yes, he really means you. And I'll see you at the top along with him. God bless you. Zig loved the Word of God, and uh, he taught, he studied the Word of God, and he taught it, and he lived it. And I want to read a passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, uh, written to by the great apostle Paul. He's actually writing to his young son in the faith, uh, Timothy, and he makes some incredible statements about his life and uh, great statements about any Christian, but especially a man like Zig Ziglar. Uh, Paul writes this, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He's about to die, and he uses the words poured out on the altar as a drink offering to the Lord. When Zig Ziglar accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, he offered himself as an offering to the Lord, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is the spiritual act of worship. He offered himself to Jesus, and Jesus used him powerfully. His life was spent well. And then he says, the time of my departure has come. He means his death. Paul knew he was going to die. You know, Zig knew that. Zig knew he was going to die. But Zig did not tremble at the prospect of death. He was prepared to meet his God. He was confident in his salvation. Zig knew he had trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He knew he had confessed his sins. He knew he had accepted God's forgiveness and Jesus' payment for his sins on the cross. He knew he had received the gift of eternal life. Zig was ready to die. 
which is in fact is the reason why he lived so well. Paul also says, he goes on to say, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the fate. Paul says, I've fought the good fight. I've lived this life well. Zig did life well. As Zig would say often, I heard them in, heard him say this in many situations, you will either say about your life, I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. Zig did. When Zig accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, he wanted to honor the Lord with his life. He did. He wanted to honor his wife and family with his love. He did. He wanted to impact the world for Jesus Christ with his witness and make a difference. He did. Zig did. You know, he's glad he did, and aren't we glad he did. He also says, I have finished the race. Speaks of faithfulness. Zig also said, it's never too late to finish well. Zig finished well all the way to the end. He was faithful. Of course, all of us know uh, Zig performed on some of the biggest stages and under the brightest lights in the world. And of course, he was faithful. He was successful. He did it well. But you know what? All of us who knew Zig well, up close and personal, and watched him do life, he was even a bigger hero, even more faithful in everything because he was real. He was authentic. It, it wasn't fake and, and phony. It was the real deal. And you know, oh, we watched him through every phase of life. You know what he was? He was faithful to his God all the way to the end. The God is not as much interested in us being famous or successful as he is about being faithful in the little things. All the way to the end, Zig was. Then Paul says, I have kept the faith. As a result of that, henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but all who've loved his appearing. Zig believed. You know, one of the amazing th things about Zig, everything Zig learned and knew and mastered, he wanted everyone else to know. Zig could sell. He wanted everybody to know how to sell. That's why he, uh, he did so many books. That's why he did so many talks. Uh, he discovered the, the essential element of attitude. He wanted everybody to have a good attitude. That's why he learned about the whole uh, secret of enthusiasm. I mean, he showed us with his life the difference enthusiasm can make. Uh, he learned how to have a happy marriage, courtship after marriage. He wanted everybody to know that. He knew how to be better than good. He wanted everybody to know how to be better than good. He knew how to raise positive kids in a negative world. He wanted everybody to know that. And Zig knew how to get to the top, and he wanted everybody to get to the top. You know what else? Zig knew Jesus. And he wanted everybody to know Jesus, the one who makes life worth living and who gives eternal life. He wants you to know that, so that. This phrase is not just of the Apostle Paul. It's not just true of Zig Ziglar. It can be true of you through faith in Jesus Christ so that you can fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith, and henceforth, because if you believe, you, there is laid up for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous just, will, will I give to you on that day, and not to you only, but to all who have loved his appearing. He wants you to know Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the life of Zig Ziglar, who he was and how he lived. In fact, he was, a, as all of us, a sinful man, an ordinary man, and yet as a grown man, he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and he said, confessed his sin and said an everlasting yes to you and his life was changed because that's what you do, Jesus. You change lives. And we saw it powerfully manifest in the life of Zig Ziglar of who he become and how he lived and the impact he made and how he loved you, how he loved his wife, his family, how he loved what he did and the way he did it that, that impacted all of us, how he loved his church, how he loved his pastor, how he loved us, how he loved me and blessed my life. All of us could give a testimony. We were grateful for his life. And, Lord, as awesome as his life was, we were grateful for the resurrection and life after death because we know as awesome as his life has been, it is even greater on the other side. As he experienced heaven, 
in the presence of the one who created him, who died for him, and then came and got him and took him home to be with him forever. And Father, we are grateful that death has been swallowed up in victory. And because Jesus lives and Zig confessed his faith in Jesus, we know Zig is alive. We know he's well. We know where he is. And we know who he's with. And we give thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Tom Ziegler, proud son. The first speech I ever gave was in a field in Arkansas. A hailstorm interrupted it. We ran to a shed, which was tin roof, which you can imagine nobody could hear anything I said. I got back to the office and they said, Tom, that'll be the hardest talk you ever give. They weren't right. I'm up here and I'm, I'm happy, sad, thankful, and blessed. I feel like I'm looking out a room of family, brothers and sisters. When I've traveled to Europe and Australia to present dad's message, I get hugs everywhere I go. It's incredible. So I wanted to share just a few things from you that I've learned, uh, some of the kind of behind the scenes secrets of dad. And these secrets, because uh, people ask all the time, you know, your dad's awesome, how does he do it? What is, how does he make it happen? So I hope this will kind of reveal some of those to you. Uh, the first thing is I've been covered up and our whole family has been covered up with email and text and Facebook posts and Twitter. And one of Alexandra's friends, Meg, actually told her mama this and I thought it was perfect. She said, she said mom, you know when you go to heaven, and Jesus greets you and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. She said, Mama, I think when Jesus meets Mr. Ziegler, he's going to say, better than well done. <laughs> so. And of course, Dad is known for his quotes. How many of you know at least one Zig quote? Well, Dad had a hundred favorite quotes, and you knew it, he, it was his favorite because before he told it, he'd say, this is my favorite quote. <laughs> and it, it wouldn't matter if it was the same one or not. But I have my own personal favorite quote. There was an incredible uh, singer, I believe, named Ethel Waters. And somebody asked her how come she could sing so good. And she said, well, God don't make no junk. Well, Dad was in my office last year, and we're sitting across the table, and he looks at me, and he says, son, you know my favorite quote? I said, which one, Dad? He said, you know, the one from Ethel Waters, God don't make no junk, and I said, yeah. He said, son, God don't make no junk, and thanks to your mother, neither do I. So that's my, that's my personal favorite Zig quote <laughs> said to me. I got an email from a friend. He was a college uh, fraternity brother uh, in college. He, he was, I believe, pre-law at the time of this occurrence. And we were in a fraternity, so we were doing fraternity things. We were coming to Dallas, and, and uh, we were going to have some fun. We stopped by the house and had dinner, and he writes me this letter real short, and he says, Tom, his name is David. He said, Tom, I've heard the news about your dad. You and your family are very much in my thoughts and prayers. I am and will always be grateful for you and your parents. It's been 26 years since you invited me to a Ziegler family dinner and shared the gospel with me. Even now, as I share that message with others, I can hear your dad's distinctive voice telling me, that grace is a gift from God that cannot be earned or deserved. I can still hear your voice welcoming me into the family of Christ. When I was a teenager, my own dad walked out of my life, never really to return. 
So in many ways, you and your dad taught my earliest lessons about what it is to be a Christian, a man, a husband, and a father. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your parents and your faith at an impressionable time in my life. Much of who I am today and much of what I do is because of your kindness and your generous faith. Like I said, I will always be grateful for your dad and your family. And it's signed the Reverend David Green. But that was dad. We bring people around him and he has an impact. There are four things that I think really make up uh, dad's impact. The first is hope. I've heard him say it a hundred times, if not a thousand in front of an audience, he would say, how many of you here today can make a decision in your personal life, your family life, or your business life in the next three weeks that would make things worse? Can I see your hands? Everybody's like, Zig said that? And then he would say, okay, how many of you can make a decision and do something in the next three weeks in your personal life, your family life, or your business life that would make things better? Can I see your hands? Of course, all the hands go up. And then dad would say, whether you realize it or not, in your own mind, you have told yourself that you have the power to make things better or worse, and the choice is yours. And that's where hope is born. Hopeless people don't take action. The student who believes they can't pass the test won't even study. If you want to have an impact in someone's life, give them hope. That was the first key. The second, this one took me a while to figure out because I've always wondered. I've sat at the foot of the greatest stages in the world, presidents and you know, celebrities and amazing speakers and, you know, some awesome people you've heard of and some incredible speakers you probably haven't heard of. And like you, I've taken notes. And then two months later, I'll get that notepad out and I'll realize I haven't done anything. Anybody have that? Okay. <laughs> Yet every day we get a letter or an email about a changed life who heard dad. And I got to thinking, what is it about dad that gets people inspired while they're in the room, but then gets them to take action when they leave. Because you know nothing really happens unless you take action. And it's this whole idea of identity. You see, Dad, he was raised in pretty much the poorest family in Yazoo City during the Depression. His dad died when he was five. Dad started selling peanuts on the corner when he was six. Went to work in the grocery store a few years later. He never did well in school. Went into the Navy, got out of the Navy, got a sales job, and for two and a half years, he didn't sell anything. Well, he did. Sold his car, <laughs> sold his furniture, <coughs> right? And then a man named P.C. Merrill looked at him and said, Zig, this is somebody in his company who he respected. He said, Zig, I've never seen such a waste, but I believe you can be a champion if you do two things. Believe in yourself and go to work on a regular schedule. So that's what dad did. Started knocking on doors every day, 9 a.m. That was his schedule. And then he went on a lifelong journey to understand what it means to believe in yourself. That next year, he finished number two out of 7,000 in the sales force. Before that, he'd better never been in the top 5,000 in the previous two and a half years. Changed his life. But here's part of the story you may not know. Over the next 10 or 12 years, he made a ton of money and lost a ton of money 10 or 12 times. He was looking at the greener grass, thinking, I can get rich quick over here, or these guys have a good deal. He moved the family, I don't know how many times, I wasn't around yet. Well, kind of at the end I was. 1972, he accepted Christ. July 4th, his reason for living changed. It was no longer about him, 
It was about him. So when people would come into a room like this, when he was speaking, their thought was, look at him, I could never be him. He talks good, he's funny, he hangs out with the rich people, belongs to the country club, he goes to Prestonwood. <laughs> then dad would tell his story and they would start thinking, if he can, I think I can. I did some study on this. Several, several research studies have been done. When you identify with somebody, you look at their past and their experience and the hard trials they've been through, and you connect. When that person gives you advice or wisdom or truth, you're much more likely to take action. In fact, they've even studied it and they know that you'll stay with it about 30% longer if you identify with somebody. So my theory is, is people would take dad's wisdom and they'd go home and they would try it 30% longer, just enough time to get a result. So why is identity so important? It's because dad's identity was totally changed. It was no longer him. It was his identity in Christ. See, I want to be like Zig because Zig's like Christ in so many ways. It's the truth that just flows through there. The third one is brokenness. This is a big one. How many of you here ever heard dad say, I never worry? Okay, that's a lot of hands. Last 10 years of his life, probably once a week, I'd hear dad say, I never worry. I did a study, and the study was from God's perspective. As a believer, what spiritual quality could I have that would honor God the most and allow God to use me. Now, we do these studies and usually you hear things like obedience or humility, and those are good ones. But the word that I settled on was brokenness. And brokenness is that idea that there is absolutely nothing I can do of any significance without him. It doesn't mean you're broken and useless. It means that you are perfectly prepared and in his hand, ready to do life like he wants you to do it. You see, dad went to bed every night knowing he had only one person to please, and that was his Lord and Savior. That was it. Imagine the boldness of being able to go out on a stage in front of 80,000 people. That's, I think, the biggest audience he had live. Knowing that there's only one audience member that matters. You see, he knew his responsibility was this, share God's truth in love. Broken people do not try to control what other people do. All they try to do is control what they do in that relationship with him. So dad would share the truth boldly, in love. And because people identified with him, they wanted it. In our industry, in speaking, there's a thing that we call around the office, we call it speakeritis. And basically speakeritis means you start believing the press clippings about how good you are. When dad became a Christian in 1972, July 4th, he was broken in debt. He said, God, I've done it my own way all my life. I got nothing to show for it. Now I'm gonna do it your way for the rest of my life. And that was his prayer every day. And it was that brokenness that allowed God to work through him. I can promise you, I've heard dad give a talk and I'm listening to the talk and five people will come up to me and they will tell me they heard five different things. And I'm, I didn't hear any of those things. 
God somehow engineered dad in such a way that his voice would come right through. And it's because he was broken. And of course, the last one is love. And I have two examples of this. The first one, Julie called me. They were up in, I think it was Madison, Wisconsin, and they were doing a big Get Motivated seminar. And this is after dad's fall, and they were doing the interview. And so our family's concern was, you know, is dad coming across right? You know, is the audience accepting his message? Because it's not the same. It's not Zig running around. It's Zig sitting there answering questions. So in that room, we had a friend of the family who was a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you know, one of those words I can't spell. And she was there, and Julie just said, would you listen today from the crowd's perspective? We want to make sure that your dad's voice, uh, we want to make sure that dad is representing himself well. She came up at the end, and she said this to Julie. Julie, there were eight or nine of the best speakers in the world here today. Polished, professional. If you've seen the lineup on a Get Motivated event, you know what we're talking about. And she said this. They gave great presentations. The eight of them were as good as you can be. But there was only one speaker in the room today who was here for one reason, and that was because he loved everybody in the room. You have nothing to worry about. That was dad. Think of the miles he put on in his career when he had no reason to travel. If he was in it for himself, he'd been there, done that 20 years ago. There was always somebody else he could reach for the kingdom. And it was a simple formula. Give them hope. Give them a truth that they could see. They would try it. And then here's the cool thing. When you give truth to somebody, even if they're not a believer, and it works, they'll start thinking, I wonder what else is there. And they'll try the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And then they ask that big question, who is the author of truth? That was dad. The last love story, and this is a message to everybody who's got a family member, and that's all of us. When I was 25, see, dad and I loved golf. We'd play right over here at Glen Eagles all the time. If he called me, I'd go. I worked for him, so I had to. Um, <laughs> we played golf. He loved golf. And uh, he called me. And of course, at that time, I thought I had the best relationship a son could ever have with their father. He called me, he said, son, let's go play golf. And those days I'd pick him up, you know, so I'd drive my car over, he'd have his, this was, he would have his spikes on already at the house. He'd be waiting in the driveway, shoes spiked up, and that would drive me nuts because he'd get into my car with his spikes and rub them. But I never said anything. I'd get his bag, I'd put it in the trunk. We'd go play golf, and we always left remembering the most incredible shot of the day and couldn't wait to get out for the next time. So I take Dad and I drop him off. I get his bag out, I set it by the door. I'm turning around to go back to the car, and he says, son, wait a second. I turn around. I said, what, Dad? He said, I need to tell you something. And he came up, and he put his hands on my shoulders like this. And he looked me right in the eye. And he said, son, I don't think I've told you enough how proud I am and how much I love you. And we hugged. And from that day forward, every time we met, we hugged. Eternity is around the door. 
I mean, it is on the other side. We don't know when. <laughs> I can remember Dad looking to my eyes. He is living by sight, and I know I will look in his eyes again in the blink of an eye. I'm Tom Ziegler, the proud son of Zig Ziegler. They made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child didn't know who you was. Didn't know you'd come to save us, Lord. To take our sins away Our eyes were blind We couldn't see And we didn't know Long a time ago, you was born, born in a manger, Lord. Sweet little Jesus born, the world. You mean, Lord, treat me mean too. But please, sir, forgive us, Lord, for we didn't know it was you. And yes, that was Zig's request, beautifully sung by Samuel this morning. Uh, a tribute to Jesse who influenced Zig and brought him to Christ. And at this Christmas season, we, we introduce you to the Savior that Jesus loved, that Zig loved, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to wrap up from what has been said today, so many beautiful tributes, testimonies. We're going to give you the opportunity to also, on a card that you've been given in your worship guide, your order of service, to pay tribute and express your personal testimony. How many words could we use and have been used today to describe Zig Ziglar? 
a teacher, communicator, leader, mentor, motivator, communicator, salesman. Zig said it's all about making the sale, closing the deal. Certainly you couldn't talk about Zig without speaking of the fact that he is a husband for all these 66 years of marriage to the beautiful redhead that he loved all the days of his life. Gene, we love you. Father, as we just heard Tom share, he was a coach. But I have a word that I think best describes Zig Ziglar. There's no doubt about it. This is the one word that wraps it all up. Christian. Zig Ziglar was a Christian through and through. When he met the Lord Jesus Christ, his life was radically transformed. He was never the same. And because he was a Christian, you know the word Christian in the Bible means like Christ or little Christ. A Christian is someone who reminds us of Jesus. Zig reminded me of Jesus. We can speak of all of his positivity and his ability, his giftedness. He always attributed each of these gifts to the Lord. But ultimately, Zig is who he is because of what Jesus did in his life. You would have never heard of Zig Ziglar apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a man in the scripture by the name of Barnabas. He was mentioned earlier. Barnabas means the son of encouragement. Mr. Encouragement, that is Zig. And in the, eighth, in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 23 and 24, Barnabas helps describe Zig. Speaking of Barnabas, when he saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord and steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Barnabas is not one of the most well-known personalities of the Bible. He's not as known as Peter or John or Paul. But Barnabas was the encourager of, the, of them all, of the disciples, the apostles. He was the one who was called upon to go and to review the grace of God in a certain place there in Antioch where they were first called Christians. It, it was Barnabas that introduced the Saul of Tarsus, the radical rabbi who who was killing Christians, now he's believing in Jesus. It was Barnabas who believed in him first and, and said, meet my friend, Brother Paul. He's the real deal. That was who Barnabas was. Always elevating others. Always advancing others. Sort of like the man who said, you can get as much as you want in life as you will help others get what they want in life. He was the son of encouragement. And there's not a person in this room, either personally or corporately, has not been encouraged by Zig Ziglar. And thousands who are watching online at this moment, millions of people who pay tribute to him this day. We can speak of his character, his conviction. You know, Zig was not cotton candy fluff. He, there was substance to this man. And the substance of this man was one of the verses that he asked us to share today, and that is Isaiah 40 and verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This is the foundation of his life. 
He would often say, I just take the Bible, the principles of the Bible, the truths of the Bible, and teach them in a way that people can understand them. It was said of Jesus, he heard that the common people heard him gladly. The common people, people like you and me, heard Zig gladly with joy and we were moved and we were motivated and, and God did things in us through him. He, he, had, he possessed character and purity and faithfulness to his wife, courage. Zig was not soft. He loved everybody and expressed it, but he had deep, courageous convictions about who Jesus is and what life is about and how we should live. But he always spoke the truth in love. But he did speak the truth. When he wrote the book about grief, the grief experience that he and Jean shared with their family and the loss of their daughter, he talked to me about the title. He said, what should I call this book? We discussed it a while and he had some ideas and and I said, you know, Zig, worldwide you're known from that initial book that you wrote after you became a Christian, The Confessions of a Happy Christian. And there may be some people out there that wonder, Zig, if all those confessions of a happy Christian are still the same. If it's really true, when, you, when you've been in the valley of the shadow, when you've, when you've gone down deep into the depths of hurt and pain, it, does this Christianity thing work? Is it still real to you? So I suggested, why don't you call it the confessions of a grieving Christian? Because the authenticity of your life and your faith I've never seen more vividly than when you walk through the valley of the shadow with your daughter and your wife, and your family. To me, Confessions of a Grieving Christian is in many ways his best book. Substance, foundation. Oh yes, he was unbelievable on a platform. But let me tell you something. He was unbelievable off that platform. This church is forever grateful for Zig's investment, teaching the Encourager class for as many years, 17, 18 years. It's our largest class and one of our most effective classes in reaching people for Christ and then teaching them to be encouraged in Christ. When we were making the big move from Hillcrest and Arapahoe in North Dallas to move this entire congregation and this church to this field of dreams here in Plano, we needed to raise a lot of money. We needed God to move in a great way. And we needed someone to lead that campaign to challenge God's people in a big way. So we asked Zig and Jean to chair, to be the honorary chairpersons of our Touching Eternity campaign. It ended up being a very successful campaign. Mike Fetchner, I hear Mike's amens this morning, led that campaign as well. But we brought a clip when we broke ground, when this was nothing but a field. And we asked Zig to stand on that day when we were breaking ground with big bulldozers, we were etching the cross on this property, saying that we boast only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Zig said something that uh, I've never forgotten and never will forget. It was actually mentioned earlier, but here's Zig saying it. To be that light on the hill where others can see, where they will look up and say, there are some people who care. I plead with you, Consider carefully the role you can play. I believe and have always believed since this mission was adopted 
that one of the great churches in the world and one of the uh, spawning grounds for future missionaries and Christian workers that touch eternity for thousands, even millions of people all over the world is going to be right here. I urge you to make sure you become a part of all of the prayer efforts, the personal commitments financially here. I believe that one of these days you will look back and say one of two things. I wish I had taken a more active part, or I'm glad I did. I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. Zig, more than anything, wanted you to know his Jesus, his Savior. We put in your worship guide, your order of service, a little card, beautifully caricatured, see at the top. Why don't you take that card out right now? Just look at it. Attitude, not aptitude, determines altitude. And it's your attitude of faith that determines your destiny. It's your decision that determines your destiny. And as I look at that little caricature, you know that escalator up there, the escalator is, is Jesus. G G Zig is at the top, not because he climbed heaven's ladder, but because Jesus lowered himself and became one of us and provided the pathway, the way, the truth, and the life that we may know him. And Zig got on that pathway and rode it all the way over the top. He wanted you to do the same. This would be a good time for you to write a personal tribute. If you just have something to say, I'm going to ask you to, you, I, there are boxes when you leave, you can drop them in. If you just want to leave them on the pews or if you want to hand them to one of the ushers, you can just say something about what Gene meant to me. We're going to give these, to, or what Zig meant to me, rather, and we're going to give these to Gene and the family. But here's why Zig really wanted you to have this card. And yes, Zig asked me to pass these cards out. So I'm doing it. The reason we wanted you to have the card is so that if you would like to confess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that you would just say, today, Here's what you need to write today. You may be a religious person. You may be not religious. But you want to see Jesus. You want to know that you're, you're a Christian. You want to know that your sins are forgiven. And you believe in the Savior that, Jesus, that Zig trusted, that, that you have put your faith in the one who died on the cross for you and rose again. If you want to do that, just say, I confess, I declare that I am a Christian. That I'm trusting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You can put your name on there or not. I would encourage you to put your name on there because that's a confession of your faith. We're not gonna, we're not gonna come after you. We're not gonna come looking for you. But this would be a way that you could confess your faith and seal the deal. When we were talking about this with Tom, Tom said, Dad always said, close the sale. So I'm closing the sale. Right on that card. I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. If you're already a believer, write a tribute to Zig. Just say, thank you, Lord, for Zig. Or here's what Zig meant to me. How are you choose? And do it now. Do it now. He was a good man. Full of faith. Full of the Holy Spirit. And many were added to the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Thank you, Lord Jesus for Zig's life and the legacy, the testimony of his faith, 
his influence upon all of us and beyond this room, the million, millions of people whose lives were changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Thank you for his influence as a Christian to charge us and challenge us and encourage us to be better, to be stronger, to live deeper, to live longer for you, for your glory. And we say what Zig wanted to say at his memorial service, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're looking at your card, we have a video of, that was prepared of just a five minute video, and then we're gonna close with a song of Zig's, something of a snippet of his life, and really it's a tribute to Zig and his family. Watch the screens.
I love Thanksgiving and Christmas because what both of those holidays do is to remind us of the great God of the universe that we can connect with in a meaningful way that day. And it makes it happen not only for our life here, but our life in eternity. For those of you who will come after me, I want to leave you with one thought that I believe will make you a better person and you will be able to help other people. I believe with all my heart that you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. When you get to heaven, I'm going to be welcoming you at the door. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than heart. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin. than anything this old world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than a man's applause. I'd I'd rather have my Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. He's of rarest bloom he's sweeter than honey right out the comb he's all that this hungering spirit needs I'd rather This old world 
affords today.